Uh, medical education sits at the crossroads of cultural shifts and rapidly evolving science and technology. Making it applicable, accurate, and relevant is really a Herculean task. All of us are dependent upon the university systems to educate and train our future physician partners, many of whom will become our own personal physicians. None of us are getting any younger. Um, the interface of the university and our medical communities in developing and implementing the products of basic science and clinical research is also highly important. Here, academic leaders serve a key role. Our keynote address speaker this morning has proven himself to engage these tasks extremely well. Dr. Lloyd Miner is the Carl and Elizabeth Nauman Dean of the School of Medicine at Stanford University. He's professor of head and neck surgery as well as bioengineering and neurobiology. Very uniquely, Dr. Miner brings together the qualities of a skilled physician, an exceptional basic scientist, and an innovative educator. An example of his research and clinical success is in the superior canal dehiscence syndrome, first described by Dr. Miner and thus, thus also known as Miner's syndrome. After describing it, he went on to develop a surgical technique for treating the process. Brief highlights of his remarkable career include his MD degree from Brown University, surgery residency at Duke University, head and neck surgery residency at the University of Chicago, clinical fellowship in otology and neuro-otology at the Ear Foundation in Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. He then spent 19 years at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, beginning as an assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, and then completing his tenure as provost and senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. He was appointed Dean of the School of Medicine at Stanford University in December of 2012. He's going to speak to us this morning about medical education as it interfaces with us as we move into the future. So please join me in welcoming Dean Lloyd Miner. Well, thank you very much. Good, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Good. Well, it's a great, maybe I'll try standing down here, see if we can uh, get a little closer, but it's a great privilege and a pleasure to be here this morning. I really appreciate the invitation uh, for me to be here for Dr. Joe Wu, our new chief of uh, the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Stanford, who will also be talking with you this morning, and we're really honored to be able to spend some time with you. As Tom mentioned, uh, Tom asked me to talk about the role of the Academic Medical Center in healthcare today, its role presently and what its role might be moving forward. So just to start out with, I have no uh, relevant financial disclosures um, and nothing to disclose related to uh, my participation in uh, continuing medical education activities. I think there, this is a time of enormous opportunity, not only in academic medicine, but in medicine more broadly. The opportunities for delivering outstanding patient care, for impacting health, have never been greater than they are today. And there are lots of reasons for that. There's such a rapid pace in biomedical research and biomedical advances today. And there's a convergence of many different disciplines that had been considered disparate in the past. So disciplines such as engineering, and traditional physical sciences have come together with life sciences to approach in new and creative ways the most challenging biomedical problems today. And we've already seen lots of examples of that, lots of examples of where engineering approaches have impacted our ability to do physiological monitoring, our ability to come up with new methods of diagnosis and treatment. And this pace of biomedical discovery, I think, is only going to continue to increase in the future as we see more and more areas of convergence. You know, I've often said that the greatest strength we have at Stanford Medicine is the fact that we're a part of Stanford University. And our school and our two hospitals that are in Palo Alto sit right on the campus of the university. So we're right across the street from the engineering school. And increasingly, faculty members in computer science, in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, many, many faculty are now interested in biomedical problems. Not because we've told them they have to be, but because these are where the really engaging academic 
scholarly challenges are for today and in the future. Well, despite these opportunities, we know that there are many, many challenges. Now, we view these challenges as being hurdles to overcome and not as roadblocks. But the next couple of slides will summarize some of them, and ones that I'm sure are familiar to all of you. Healthcare in America is expensive, extraordinarily expensive, over 17% of the gross domestic product. We spend about $8,600 per year for every man, woman, and child in the United States for health care. That's more than double the OECD median. In fact, if you take the difference between the OECD median and what we pay on health care, if you take that difference, that something like $1.2 trillion difference, that's more than the budget deficit of the United States. It's more than double the annual budget of the Department of Defense of the country. Now you could say that, you know, maybe that cost is justified if we were getting superior outcomes. After all, what really is, how can you really assign a cost to health? I mean, it's so vital to each of us. It's so vital to our patients. How can you really assign a cost to health? And yet we know that in so many ways, when we look at outcomes, we don't stack up so well compared to our peers in developed countries around the world. This is just one measure in life expectancy at birth, where we don't look very good compared to our peers, all of which are lower cost in terms of the expenditures on health care than are we. That's not a simple problem. There are many factors that impact these global measures of health, such as life expectancy at birth. There are socioeconomic factors, demographic factors, but it all rolls into this complex picture of health. And I think one message today, one message that we're trying to address at Stanford Medicine is that we want to be seen as being involved and engaged with a discussion of all aspects of health. Not just the more traditional complex care aspects that still are a vital part of academic medical centers like Stanford, but all aspects that impact health of society, health of individuals. And part of the reason for this complexity and for this divergence between cost and outcomes is that there's so many factors in addition to what we traditionally consider to be within the umbrella of healthcare, there's so many factors that impact health. In fact, the traditional areas of medical care, if we include genomics and genetics with that as being under the umbrella of medical care, although a lot of that we can't do anything about, our genetics and our makeup, but a, only a quarter of the factors that impact health would be considered to be under the traditional domain of what we as physicians and healthcare providers traditionally address. The other factors, such as behavioral factors, economic, and environmental, and social factors, account for the vast preponderance of impacts, of influences and impacts on health. And yet increasingly, I think we have to figure out ways to see our role as broader than just that traditionally focused on medical care without turning our back on it, because although in global measures of outcome, life, like life expectancy at birth, we don't stack up so well in the United States compared to other OECD countries. In areas of complex care, in areas that involve getting new treatments to the benefit of our patients in a rapid way, in areas such as getting the newest, most transformative technologies to the benefit of our patients, in those areas we traditionally stack up very well compared to peer countries in the OECD. So we don't want to turn our back on what we're doing well in the most tertiary and complex aspects of medical care, but we need to see our role and our responsibility as broader than just those areas. So let's talk a little bit about, if we use Stanford Medicine as an example, the example that I know the best and the example that I'm here to talk to you about today most directly, but how do we in Stanford Medicine see ourselves as a catalyst for change and how do we see ourselves as leading the biomedical revolution? Because that's what we aspire to do as an institution. We should be providing outstanding care to the patients that come to us to receive care. 
We also should be training the leaders of tomorrow, leaders in biomedicine tomorrow. And we should be doing the transformative research that then permeates across the country and around the world and enables all of us to deliver better health care to our patients. So I see a role, a central role for academic medical centers and for Stanford in specific to be leaders in innovation, to empower the future leaders and train the future leaders of tomorrow, and to transform patient care in this century of biomedicine. Now, as Tom mentioned, I'm an otolaryngologist, and I had the privilege a few weeks ago of making a trip up with some of my colleagues and spending some time with Tom and with the otolaryngology group, group that is a part of Northern California Medical Associates. And I'm most known in my field for the discovery of a clinical syndrome called uh, Superior Canal Dehiscence Syndrome. I, I appreciate Tom mentioning, and I, I, I feel a little sheepish about the fact that it now seems to have my name as an eponym, and I'm sometimes asked, well, well, what do I feel about that? How do I feel about that? And I guess, I guess I'm just happy I'm not Dr. Foley uh, in that regard, in terms of there has to be an eponym. But, but anyway, so, so I, did, I did describe this and, and developed a surgical treatment for it, and I'm, I'm pleased about that. There have been lots of patients receive benefit from the surgery, uh, not just from me, but from the now you know, hundreds of otologists and neurotologists around the world that do this surgery. Um, and this is a slide on the left there that shows you what the problem is. This is a picture through the middle cranial fossa of the roof of the superior canal. And there's a, sort of a, a fleshy looking area there that ought to be covered with bone. That's the opening in the, in the roof of the superior canal that causes this problem in patients that have the syndrome. And it can be a very debilitating syndrome. Okay, and the surgery uh, really can be transformative in patients' lives. But look, this is not diabetes, it's not obesity, it's not high blood pressure. It's not the problems by and large in the patients that are coming to your office every day of the week. So, you know, traditionally in medicine, particularly in academic medicine in the United States, we've been focused on solving these extremely complex problems, but complex in a specifically defined way. So this syndrome has a very clearly identified, defined physiological basis. We probably understand it better than almost any other inner ear disorder, at least in any other inner ear balance disorder. But it doesn't represent the complexity of, for example, the problem of obesity in the United States today. I mean, wow, talk about a problem that's truly complex because it has social factors. It has marketing demographic factors in terms of our diet and how the diet in the United States has changed and why it's changed. It for sure has physiological factors, understanding metabolism, being better able to manipulate metabolism. And it's loaded with behavioral factors as to why people get into a pattern of, of diet and lack of exercise that leads to obesity. And so it's hard to just confine an approach to, it's impossible to confine an approach to obesity that just takes one route, that just takes the route that I as a neuroscientist and, and, and otolaryngologist, neurotologist, was able to pursue in defining this syndrome and developing an effective surgical treatment. And that's an important role for academic medical centers in partnership with you, with all of you, to be able to tackle these multifaceted complex problems that are such an enormous challenge and burden for healthcare, not only in America, but around the world. So in order for us at Stanford to be able to better do that, we need to partner. We need to partner with you, with groups around Northern California, to develop a regional network of care, and that is shown on the slide here of where we now have outpatient facilities, relationships through the network we're building through University Healthcare Associates and Packard Children's Health Associates, in order to interface with community-based practitioners, in order to extend our ability to have a positive, what we hope will be a positive impact on primary care in our region, and in order to develop those referral patterns that are so important to us in our complex care uh, that we deliver uh, at our two hospitals uh, located in Palo Alto. So there are multiple reasons for building up this network of care. If we look at academic medical centers in the past, we've really been focused on what we might consider to be 
the present and the future for one of the four aspects of clinical care delivery. And that is, we've been principally focused on complex care. But there are other aspects, other very important aspects to healthcare delivery. There's the, the, the important aspect of the network of care as shown here on this slide. There's increasingly accountable care, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Shifting the way we're paid as healthcare providers from a fee-for-service environment where each service is reimbursed to a more global risk stratification where we as a network of providers and healthcare institutions assume responsibility for the cost and outcomes-based risk for a covered population of patients. And in, of increasing importance, there's virtual care, which is given the region of the country we live in and the ability now and the impact of technology is gonna have a profound impact moving forward on the way we deliver health care. So complex care, network of care, accountable care, and virtual care, sort of the four rubric areas of the future in terms of health care delivery. Traditionally, we at Stanford and most other major academic medical centers have been focused on only that first area, complex care. And that will always, meet, that will always be the central core of what, of what an academic medical center is about. It's the place where patients come because their diseases are so complex that they require the attention, they require the skills and the training expertise of multiple different specialists all under one roof that can come together to deliver the very best care to patients. But that can't be the only area that an academic medical center focuses on. So one reason for us building up a network of care is that as recently as about three years ago, we had at Stanford seven FTEs in primary care, seven on our faculty. Now we've grown that now to over 40 on our faculty, but even that isn't, isn't, isn't even close to being adequate for what we need in terms of, of the healthcare we want to deliver and the healthcare we want to impact. And building up a network of care, building up a network of affiliations with primary care physicians in our region and with specialists in our region is an important part of our strategy to have a positive impact on healthcare in our region and around the country. Now in the past, academic medical centers have focused mainly on acute care. It's that, those episodes of care, the very sickest patients at their very sickest points in their illnesses. But we know that, yes, and that, that will continue to be an important part of our mission, but we need to be focused more on the management of chronic conditions First, if we do collectively, if we do a better job of managing the chronic conditions, we won't have as many of the acute, epi the acute episodes. We'll be able to keep people healthier and at home for longer periods of time rather than in the emergency department or on the inpatient wards. So in order to do that, a number of years ago, we started a clinical excellence research center led by the person pictured on this slide, Dr. Arnie Milstein. Arnie's had a distinguished career both in academia and in industry. He was the founder of the LeapFrog Group, one of the early groups that evaluated healthcare delivery systems, furnished that information to employers so as they were negotiating health insurance contracts, they could look for the healthcare providers and the networks that offered the very best outcomes. And one of the things that Arnie has started is something that is termed the Ambulatory Care ICU. Notion is that we started ICUs in hospitals decades ago because we could see that by bringing together very skilled nurses, very skilled physicians, and grouping patients in a geographically defined area within a hospital called an ICU, that we got better outcomes than if the patients were spread out all over the place. And, the, and then the expertise of the doctors and the nurses taking care of those very sick patients in the hospital grew because they were focused on that particular area and those particular problems. Well, the same notion is now being applied to chronic care of patients with multiple medical conditions. The pie chart on the right shows something that I know you're all familiar with. It's, it's the distribution of Medicare spending relative to number of chronic medical conditions, chronic medical comorbidities. So 69% of the Medicare dollar goes to patients with five or more medical comorbidities. 
Now, those, that 69% of the Medicare dollar is delivered to only about 22% of Medicare recipients, Medicare enrollees. So the majority of expenditures is going to a comparatively small proportion of the total number of Medicare recipients. Those are the most complex patients. They're the patients that are in and out of our emergency rooms and our inpatient hospitalizations. And if we can manage them with the same level of acuity in the outpatient setting, or a comparable level of acuity in the outpatient setting that we do in the inpatient setting, number one, they'll be healthier because they won't be getting nosocomial infections in our hospitals. And number two is they'll be a lot happier because they'll be at home with their family and their friends and not, not isolated in a hospital. So the ambulatory care ICU uses principles and delivery mechanisms such as home health care aides, nurses, telemetric monitoring in order to make sure that patients are receiving, and frequent outpatient visits, to, in order to make sure that patients are receiving the very best and consistent integrated care in the outpatient environment. Well, in the past, we at academic medical centers and Stanford Medicine have been mainly focused on the care itself, particularly the care we deliver in our hospitals, and not so much on the way we deliver care or the, the global aspects of care delivery. And that's changing moving forward. It absolutely needs to change moving forward. We've heard from our patients the necessity to make the change moving forward. So starting first in cancer, starting in cancer because that cancer patients are oftentimes the most complex patients. They re their care that they receive for their cancer frequently occurs over the course of weeks, months, even years. They require lifelong surveillance and follow-up. There are multiple different care providers involved in delivering cancer care. And in the midst of all of that complexity, there are innumerable opportunities for things to fall between the cracks, for things to get lost, for things to be poorly coordinated, for patients and their families not knowing to whom they should turn to get their questions answered because they have five or six different doctors. But we want to change that. We want to create a coordinated, integrated, patient-centered cancer experience for patients who are receiving care through our cancer center in ways that are unparalleled. And we don't want to just limit that to what we're doing at our cancer institute, our cancer center. We want to validate the methods and then make them widely available. So we've sort of envisioned the cancer care triad with the patient at the center and then their cancer, a cancer guide. This is an oncologic nurse. And every patient coming into our cancer center will be assigned this care coordinator, this care navigator. And this nurse will be with that patient at every single appointment, regardless of what specialty it's in, regardless of you know, when it occurs over the course of their treatment, to make sure that their care delivery experience is integrated and coordinated. Although their care may come from multiple physicians, there will be one lead physician for each patient. And the patient's family will be integrally involved in, in the experience and integrally involved in the decision making with the patient uh, to make sure that, that the patient advocates are as involved and can be as helpful to the patient as, as, the, care deliver, as the people responsible for the care delivery. Well, we've recently, only recently actually in America, been focused on quality, really within the past decade, um, that, that we've realized that we have to be much more attentive to quality. But quality is not enough anymore. We have to be looking more at value, with value being defined as outcomes divided by cost. We've got to lower the cost of healthcare delivery in America. In doing so, though, we've got to improve the outcomes. That becomes a significant challenge and opportunity for us. The graph at the bottom shows the relationship between quality, and quality is measured by some Medicare indices on, on best practices related to disease, disease management like congestive heart failure, acute myocardial infarction. Not complex areas, but just how often did patients get the recommended treatment for those conditions? So there are 50 dots there, and the y-axis is the composite measure of quality. If you're higher, that's better. If you're lower, that's worse. And then the x-axis is spending in dollars. You can see there's no relationship between spending and quality. It's all over the map. 
So that really is the motivation, one of the motivations be behind accountable care organizations, behind what the Affordable Care Act was, was trying to do in addition to ensuring more Americans, but also making health care more affordable, making health care more value-based. And what accountable care organizations seek to do is to transfer the risk from the being assumed exclusively by insurers and by patients and put some of that risk back on the shoulders of healthcare organizations and physicians so that we're either re reimbursed based upon outcomes or we get a bundled payment for management of a particular diagnosis over a period of time or in the case of fully accountable care we get a payment for the management of the lives of a patient of a patient panel and portfolio. Hard to know where that's going to settle in in terms of the proportion of health care 10 years from now in America that is delivered through accountable care organizations and what proportion remains in a more traditionally based fee-for-service environment. I think it'll be very, very regionally dependent. And it's particularly hard to know in no Northern California how that will settle out because already we have roughly 40% of the covered lives in Northern California that are, that are in Kaiser, which is an example of an accountable care organization. Just something to keep in mind, we, we felt that this was important. We, we didn't want to be followers in this initiative. We wanted to be leaders. So we started our own ACO-like organization this past fall, and we started it with Stanford employees, Stanford University and, and employees and the employees of our two hospitals there in Palo Alto. We priced it at the Kaiser price point so that people are not paying any more for joining Stanford Healthcare Alliance, which is our ACO-like risk-sharing uh, insurance product. We priced it identical to Kaiser so that people can make that choice, uh, not based upon cost, but based upon where they felt like they could receive the care that they needed and wanted to receive. All Stanford faculty are participants are care the providers in uh, the Stanford Healthcare Alliance. After we've shown that we can make this work with our people, we want to make this more broadly available to corporations, to companies uh, in, our, in our region. Now, of course, to make something like this Healthcare Alliance, like this ACO-like product work, to make it work, we have to have a network of primary care physicians so that patients and their families can get care close to home, and so that this network can then refer the patients that need to be referred to our facilities and to our specialists and to our hospitals in Palo Alto in a fluid and timely manner. Well, we've always been in medicine focused on the patient, and let's always hope that never changes. That should always remain our primary responsibility is to the lives and well-being of our patients. But increasingly, we know that to deliver the very best pay care to each individual patient, we have to be more focused on population health because it's through the study of populations, through the study of groups of patients, that we can learn how to deliver the very best care to each individual patient based upon his or her genetic makeup, based upon phenotypic characteristics, based upon their responsiveness to certain medications and not to others. So we have to see ourselves as building a learning healthcare system. This is a major priority for us at Stanford. So what do we mean by a learning healthcare system? Fundamentally, it's using evidence-based practice, so implementing and following and monitoring the care delivery pathways that we know are the best care delivery pathways in diseases that have already been well studied, such as diabetes. So using that and implementing evidence-based practice, but then constantly learning from what the care we're delivering to develop an individualized approach to care for each patient. So evidence-based practice driving practice-based medicine in a constantly learning environment. To do this, we need to harness the power of big data, enormous amounts of data available today Stanford traditionally has been, has had enormous strength in computation. We played a big role in the development of Silicon Valley, and we still have some of the true thought leaders 
in both dealing with huge data sets, but also in developing the analytical tools based upon inferential reasoning. You know, one of the challenges in big data is, is there, it's hard to do hypothesis-based testing or research. What you're looking is for relationships between and among elements of the data. And then you have to evaluate the strength of those relationships in order to get back to inferences about what could be the causation. And healthcare delivery is a great place to do that sort of research and have that sort of impact. In the past, of course, and in the future as well, the contact between a physician, a care provider, and a patient will always, mean, will always be at the core of healthcare delivery. But no longer will that be the only way we deliver healthcare. We have enormous opportunities in the virtual arena, as I talked about before. Pictured on the left is Bill Kennedy, one of our pediatric urologists. Uh, so Bill has a, has a clinic in Monterey, and I think he goes to that clinic physically once a month, but through a telemedicine setup, he communicates with patients and families and providers in Monterey on at least a weekly basis. So he can do pre-op evaluations through telemedicine. He can do post-op follow-up. And the patient satisfaction through this sort of interaction has been enormous uh, because it's more timely interaction with the physician and, and also it, it involves, it cuts down on the trips back and forth both for the patients and for the provider. So we'll see telemedicine evolve, I think, even more. It doesn't have to be as sophisticated as uh, the true telemedicine ports, although those have now gotten very sophisticated incorporating things such as ultrasound and lots of other advanced diagnostics. But there can be secure methods of uploading pictures. So baby has a rash, take a picture with the iPhone, transmit it in a secure way to the doctor and make that picture a part of the patient's medical record so it can be referred to down the, down the road. That's happening today. It needs to happen in a much more fluid way, both for patients and providers, than it is today. We want to be a leader in, in, in developing and implementing those virtual technologies and getting them out to, to others, particularly to others that are in our network first and then more broadly. We're, these types of virtual innovations have also impacted medical education. We're seeing less and less of the passive experience of students come to lecture, spend six hours in lecture every day, take notes, go home, study, take the test. In several courses, starting first with biochemistry, we flip the classroom. So there are short videos that cover a particular topic, as well as uh, textbook-like descriptions of the topic, that the students are expected to review in advance and work through a problem set. And when they come to class, they're not sitting passively in a seat listening to uh, a professor talk about the topic. They're interacting with their colleagues and with the professor on the problems that they've worked on solving. This has led to an increase in attendance at the classes, for one thing, but it's also led to a marked improvement in the performance of the students on the exams that are given in the course, because it's just a more effective way to learn than sort of the passive interchange between a faculty member and a student. So we expect to see that broaden, and of course, this has the potential to transform continuing medical education as well. In the past, we as doctors have been focused on our role as an individual, and we don't want to ever get away from the accountability and the responsibility that we have as physicians. But increasingly, we need to see ourselves as integral members of a team, and as the team, and as the team as being the major implementer of healthcare delivery, because as a team, we're far more effective than we are as a group of, of isolated individuals. Teamwork has been shown to be the foundation of coordinated and safe healthcare delivery. Uh, when Peter Pronovost, one of my uh, former colleagues from Johns Hopkins and an innovator in uh, safety initiatives in the country, he came up with a simple checklist for inserting central lines. You know, checking off things such as wash your hands, sterilize the field where you're going to insert, uh, insert the device, uh, drape it sterilely and make sure that everybody who's doing the central line insertion has been checked off and certified as being experienced and competent in doing it. 
And that's led to, as has been widely publicized both in the medical literature and the, and the lay press, a marked, reduced in, marked reduction in central line infections and lots of other morbidities in ICUs. Teamwork is also the foundation for scientific work moving forward. Yes, individual scientists and, and innovations coming from individuals will always be important, but the really complex problems of today, the problems like we talked about before, obesity, require a team approach in ways that, that you just can't get to from a group of isolated individuals. So through our uh, Clinical Translational Science Award, our CTSA, which we call Spectrum, we're providing the catalyst, the motivation to bring our scientists together, to work together in groups and teams to solve these complex problems. In the past, we've been focused on discovery and innovation, and that will remain a mantra that I think innovation for Stanford will always be at our centerpiece. But in the future, we also want to be focused on translation, getting those advances to the benefit of patients. And in the future, even more focused on origination. So if you think of innovation at its extreme, it's about being the first mover. It's about being the originator for new ideas. And one of the things that I focus on a lot as dean is making sure that our faculty have the resources to be originators. Because NIH grants, by and large, don't support really innovative originating research. They support research that's been proven to have a, a track record, proven to work. Because when funding is tight, and it is very tight for the federal government today for research, the funding gets awarded typically to the investigators and to the projects that have a known track record. That people can say, well, we know we're going to get good results. And yet, all of us know that really transformative innovation and advances have been built on the backs of failures. So we want to fund innovation, and we want to fund some failures as well, because we know that those failures are the precursors for successes moving forward. This is a picture from last year of our MD-PhD retreat uh, that we have every year. Currently, 12% of the graduates from Stanford School of Medicine graduate with a PhD degree in addition to an MD degree. That's one of the highest percentages in the country, and we want it to be even higher. So we'll probably grow our cohort of MD-PhD students by maybe a third over the course of the next five years or so, because we believe the training experience we provide for these remarkable young people uh, is exceptional at Stanford. And we want to be a place where we're known for training uh, scientists, clinicians uh, moving forward. And we want to broaden the definition of the type of scholarship done by MD-PhD students. Yes, there will still be the largest number doing traditional biomedical research, but we have one MD-PhD student today who's getting her PhD in economics from Stanford. We have a couple who are getting their PhDs in sociology, I think three or so in anthropology, and I would like to see that group, that cohort of MD-PhD students in the social sciences grow moving forward because they're the people that are gonna be able to grapple with these difficult socioeconomic factors that have such a profound impact on healthcare in addition to the more traditional biological factors. Federal support, as I said before, is diminishing for research. We, our faculty are outstanding. They've traditionally done quite well, but we can't be complacent. And I spend a lot of my time interacting with our donors, explaining to them the remarkable work that our faculty do, are doing. And, and enlisting their support in making sure that our faculty continue to do amazing work. Now, one example of some of this innovative, uh, originating work that's going on is being done by Ioana Osaki, pictured on this slide. She's a developmental biologist, uh, developmental and, and studies developmental genetics, and she's studying the genetics of facial expression, how the genetic programming of facial contour facial expression is developed. And of course, that's related then to cleft problems and, the, and lots of other craniofacial abnormalities that, that we don't have a good genetic understanding for. Research that, yes, is federally funded, but at its cutting edge forefront is not going to be competitive for federal grants. And, and through a series of over 20 innovation awards last year, we were able to support these out-of-the-box type projects that will, in the future, 
lead to the transformative advances. So the pressure for federal grants is on short-term results, it's on deliverables in a very defined period of time. And truly innovative research can't be constrained to that sort of a, a, a rigid time frame. So our leadership role, our vision is to lead the biomedical revolution. To do that, we need to have excellence in each of our three mission areas, patient care, research, and teaching. That's necessary for leadership, but it's not sufficient. In order to lead, we have to be preeminent. In order to be preeminent, preeminent we have to leverage and build interactions between and among our mission areas that enable the whole to be far greater than the simple sum of its parts. And a part of that, a part of building that whole, very much involves partnerships with you. It involves partnerships with you through the networks that we're building. It involves partnerships with you through being able to communicate with you and listen and learn the problems that you face in your practices and see how we can now address these through our development of a learning healthcare system and then how we can be benef a benefit to you and your practices through the work that we're doing. Our values are excellence, innovation, collaboration, and diversity. And we feel that together with the outstanding faculty we have, with the partnerships we're building with you and your practices, we have an extraordinarily exciting future. So if we look ahead, what will the future of Stanford Medicine look like 10 years from now, if and when we're successful in doing the things that I've talked with you about today. Well, this is kind of a, a description of some of the aspects. I think one a central point is that we're known as a place of delivering outstanding patient care. Yes, complex care, but also outstanding patient care through the networks that we've developed in our region and through our interactions with physicians and with networks around the country and around the world. We'll know that we're outstanding if we've continued to innovate and if we can look 10 years from now, look back over the, over the previous 10 years and say, well, these are things that have come out of Stanford. These are things that Stanford started and then we carried them forward or through the work that we did in early stages, they were carried forward by others. We'll, we'll know that we've achieved our goal if the next generation of biomedical leaders, many of those are people that have, that have received their training or a portion of their training at Stanford and that they are going out and impacting others through the care they're delivering and through the teaching and the research that they're doing. And we must never, as a part of this process, we must never forget the importance of compassion, the importance of always maintaining a patient-centered approach, and the importance of the ultimate reason that all of us in this room got into medicine is our desire to have a positive impact on the lives of others. We do that through our patient care, we do it through our research, we do it through our teaching, but in the end, that's how we will be judged, that's how our outcomes will be judged, that's what society expects from us at Stanford Medicine as an academic medical center, and expects from all of us as physicians in this remarkable profession of medicine. So thank you very much. If we have a few minutes for questions, I'll, I'll be happy to try to answer them and I'll be around at the break and, and look forward to meeting with you. And if, if you have other questions you want to contact me afterwards, uh, uh, the folks here certainly know how to reach me. Yes? So the question is, how will the primary care physician of the future distinguish himself or herself from the best nurses and uh, advanced practice providers that are, uh, that are also in the practice environment? I think in many cases, there won't be as large of a distinction. And the role of primary care physicians, I think, is evolving. It will evolve differently in different practices in different places. But the role of a primary care physician is interacting on a daily basis with advanced practice providers and having a larger panel of patients because that primary care physician is working closely with advanced practice providers that in many practices that will become the model of the future. Not in all because some patients won't want that sort of experience and because some primary care physicians won't, will not want 
that sort of engagement with advanced practice providers. So I don't think that one size will fit all, but I do think that advanced practice providers are playing an increasingly important role in, in the delivery of primary care in many different settings. Yes? Students out of your classes the last few years have gone into primary care? Great, great question. That follows up on something Tom asked me to address. Um, it, 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 Tom, when I spoke to him before this talk, said, congratulated us. And I don't place a lot of stock on US News rankings, but, and there are a host of problems with them. But Stanford School of Medicine was ranked number two uh, in medical schools in the United States. If you went down on the list and you, you looked at the various sub areas, in primary care we were ranked somewhere in the 60s or something like that. And we have not in the past placed an emphasis on primary care. I'm pleased that in June of last year when we graduated uh, 96 new physicians, 12 of them matched in primary care focused residencies, either family medicine or a primary care internal medicine residency or combined med peds residency, 12. That's the highest proportion of any class we've ever had. Is that enough? No, probably not. So we're developing, we, we now have a primary care interest group. Our, the faculty, I mentioned that we went from seven FTEs to now over 40. All of them are engaged in, uh, in, in, in teaching and training our medical students. We're looking for opportunities to get our medical students into community-based primary care practices so that they can have an opportunity to, to observe and interact with primary care physicians and with patients in a primary care environment. We're also building what I think is, schol is scholarly framework around primary care, particularly through the learning healthcare system and population health sciences. I would love it if some of our MD PhDs were focused. In fact, the, our student who's getting um, her, one of our students who's getting her PhD in sociology as well as her MD is going to go into primary care. She has a couple years left on her PhD, but she plans to match in a primary care residency afterwards. So, so it's a process, this is a culture change, and it's going to take time for us uh, to do it. But what I've told our students and, 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 and our faculty is, I am just as proud of those 12 students that matched in primary care residencies uh, and left our school last June as I am of the MD PhD students that are going to go off and do amazing research or the MD MBA students that have already started three companies and are going to start 10 more in their career. I'm just as proud of those primary care focused students and I think how we affirm and value our students plays a big role in terms of how they decide what they want to do. Another thing that I, I think helps us at Stanford is we have the lowest graduating debt of any medical school in our peer groups. About $96,000 per year is our average graduating debt. Now that's still high, but the mean across the country right now is around $150,000. But it's something that we've worked very hard on through, through financial aid and something that I focus on a lot with my fundraising and how we, we allocate our endowment payout. Uh, is to make sure we can keep our students debt down. Of course, for students that are graduating with several hundred thousand dollars worth of debt going into primary care is a really big commitment because they're making a commitment to an income differential that right now with the way we reimburse in the country is quite large. Yes? Some people suggested that, that to that point that you go into primary care and you actually well, I, I think it's, it's something that enter, needs to enter into the national debate, yes. I think it, it, what was proposed, one proposal I saw was to, if you will, tax some of the subspecialty residencies and, and funnel that back to the primary care residencies to enable more debt forgiveness. I for sure think we need to look at ways to help, and we already do this with housing for faculty we hire, but also ways to help uh, with debt assistance for those people that are entering specialties that are not going to remunerate as well as special as well as the specialties I think we need to explore those mechanisms uh, just uh, when I think about the care of uh, people who live in settings of care where they have trouble getting into a physician's offices I think of uh, assisted living uh, facilities uh, and also even in uh, post-acute care where I work uh, telemedicine would be a huge advantage for physicians uh, allowing, uh, and where rapid response is so important and so seldom happens, 
Is that uh, on the immediate horizon, uh, uh, kind of generalizing that out to these, uh, your partners? Yes. So the, I think, so we can look at telemedicine in terms of a telemedicine system, and there are many out there. One is made by Cisco, and, and, and there is an upfront cost to that, the unit and then the bandwidth for the, for the transfer. But our, the, the EMR that we use uh, at Stanford is EPIC. Right now, we can embed, patients can securely transmit a photo uh, through the My Health portal that will then securely enter the, uh, the system and be viewed by the provider. Now, stepping that up to then getting video links is, uh, is something that's in process. So there's a lot of low-tech uh, virtual interaction, given that all of us, most all of us have smartphones these days, that, that I think can be explored. It's really just a matter of working and transforming the EMR, and we, we've got folks working on that. But I agree with you, that could be really, really transformative if in the middle of the night there's a problem and the nurse could just take a video of it and, and send it and the provider has it immediately. Well, thank you very much. Tom, thank you. Thank you, Lloyd.